So it's an interesting topic, but I do think that the sort of ethical issues, I um, mean, really important ones here, um, are in a different ballpark. And of course, you know, the whole definition of training psychotherapists uh, is around learning opportunities and how can a person learn to be a psychotherapist if they don't sort of uh, learn by experience? And with that may come so some so-called mistakes. Yeah. Is the yeah. Most, most important is how you handle it afterwards. Definitely. I agree. And the other, you know, take away all learning from this podcast episode, if anybody's interested in, you know, what I take away from this podcast is not to Google things. <laughs> Yeah, because that list that you came up with of the ten things, do you know what I mean? I, I suppose it's a good starting point, but I often say I I say it quite a lot with my clients as well. Is step away from Google. Google is not good. We demystify what goes on behind the therapy room door. Join us on this voyage of discovery and co-creative conversations. This is the Therapy Show, Behind Closed Doors podcast, with Bob Cook and Jackie Jones. Welcome back to episode 85 with myself, Jackie Jones, and the wonderful Bob Cook to the Therapy Show, Behind Closed Doors. And what we're going to be talking about this week, Bob, is making mistakes in the therapy process. I'm glad I've brought my cup of tea up. I know <laughs> the people who have got the podcast won't be able to say it, but... I... Uh, people who haven't got the podcast but watching me on audio on my channel um, can see the cup of tea. So I'm, I'm glad I've, I've done that. Um, oh, well, you know, this title, I, I, I only knew recently, I forgot when it was, um, when this would be the title. So I, I, I like to talk a lot in this podcast about um how you repair ruptures in the psychotherapy process. Yes. Uh, see, I think mistakes are all learning, learning uh, experiences and they even can be seen as gifts. It's, it's how you handle the ruptures uh, in the psychotherapy program, uh, process, which is most important. But anyway, I thought I'd just put mistakes into psychotherapy into Google. And as many, many references to sort of five therapeutic mistakes, common counselling mistakes. So anyway, I just read, I just picked the 10 here from um, Psychology Today. I'll just read them out. And yes. then, right, number one they've got, forgetting the important players in the client's life. Okay. It's crucial for therapists yeah. to take careful notes following sessions which include recording the names of significant others in the client's story, confusing the name of the client's ex-husband and current partner in the midst of the therapeutic journey is not acceptable. Very parent, isn't it? It is, but um, it's very true. <laughs> well, I'd like to say something about it in a minute. Uh, the therapist should be immersed in the story. Okay, now let's... All these number one to time are very parent-led about should this and should that and should not. I think that most therapist counsellors, um, regardless of what type of memory they've got, actually, um, do their best to actually remember yeah. uh, the narratives of the story and, you know, and may or may not sometimes in the process forget some of the players Plays is the wrong one. Some of the major key factors in the client's story, and even might forget their name or even give a give another name. Um, but you see, it's not so much that. I mean, that may cause the rupture in the psychotherapy process. I feel I'm going to be saying this many times. What I'm going to say now, it's how you handle the rupture. Yeah, it's not so much that you're forgetting is the problem. I mean, uh, okay, a person. Uh, I, was, I was in therapy myself, so if if my uh, therapist forgot my wife's name or something, okay, I might be momentarily hurt, if you want to put that way. Um, however, it's how the therapist handles it, which yeah. is the next step. So, for example, if they 
say, oh, sorry, or, or some sort of apology or some sort of accounting for the hurt it caused me, if it did. Yeah. That's the most important thing. Yeah. Because then I think all, all these ruptures I'm going to talk about, or we're talking about here, if we want to call them mistakes, um, can be dealt with. And then yeah. most of them can be dealt with by accounting for the inadvertent converse forgetfulness or accounting for the whatever. Because, you know, the other way to look at this, I, 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 and you, I'm sure you're going to have a lot of thoughts on this, which may even be different from mine, but an average therapist, an average one that see, works five days a week, might have 20 clients a week. Yeah. You might have it on their books. Let's say 20. Let's just say that. I know clients have therapists have many more. And if they're working relationally over time with a client, uh, or you know, that they, they they've got a lot to remember. Yeah. Now they usually they usually remember the emotional stories, but somebody who, who just comes for the first time, uh, they may may not remember. And also there could be a lot of transferential issues in this where say the client does reminds them of their mother or something like that. So unconsciously they may forgot, forget the in inverted commas um, mother's name or however you want to look at it. The most important thing I think is how they handle the so-called rupture. Yeah, to acknowledge it, yeah. Oh. yeah. Because therapists aren't perfect. God no. Even more so, I, I, you know, I'm of a certain age where menopause and one thing and another, it's yeah. like you do have brain fog every so often. And it's like I, that I, that name is just not in my brain at all today. Yeah. I was astonished. I'm going to read a few more out. How almost every so-called mistake the psychological today list is, it. it it's very parent. They should be doing this. They shouldn't be doing this. Yeah. And I sort of have some resistance in the word should. Me uh, too. I, I think it's I, something banned from, from yeah. the vocabulary. Yeah. I don't think therapists go out of their way to um, hurt hurt their clients or 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 whatever it is I'm going to be reading out at the moment. But far, by far the most important thing is how they then deal with that. Yeah, yeah, hundred percent. I agree, and like I said, just acknowledging that you've forgotten or a mistake, rather than trying to, you know, pussyfoot around it or avoid the situation or whatever. Yeah, that's one thing. Yeah, because sometimes it's not even just the client and the partner. They've got you know three kids as well that they often talk about, and you you know, for if you have twenty clients, for every one of those clients, there's probably five or six important people in that person's life. So you're talking over a hundred names that you've got to try and pull out the bag sometimes. And remember, and I, I don't I don't want to excuse therapists here, but the second point I want to say in this um how we deal ruptures um process is um besides apologizing or accounting for the so called rupture is imperative i think the therapist then goes on to say something like and is this familiar for you in other words is it familiar for you that people have disappointed you yeah or is it familiar in your life that you feel you felt discounted so they 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 use the if you want to call this mistake, but I'm going to say mistake always with inverted commas, to inquire about somebody's past and script. Yeah. That's what I mean by gift. Yeah. Yeah, because it is a valuable tool. Oh. Yeah, it's like, is it familiar for you to be disappointed in the way that you feel disappointed in me now? Yeah. Because in a way, no disrespect to all the therapists and counsellors listening to this. Um, they're not the most important people. The no. most important people are the people in the person's history who have continually, in a cumulative way, disappointed or hurt them. 
And it's a good opening for exploration around all of that in the therapy room. Oh. Yeah. So you must have, you must have surely the, the many, you know, errors, mistakes, which is whatever we're going to call this. You would have followed this through and say, well, I, I assume you both could, you know, and is this a repetitive process? And yeah. Have you felt this way before? Yeah. Well, yeah. Whatever it is. Yeah. Yeah. And it, it's, it's like you say, it's about using it as an opportunity to explore it. Yeah. It's a gift. It is. Process. And it's a lovely way of looking at it because I know, you know, some of the people listening that are quite new to it don't want to make mistakes, but we are only human and we will make mistakes in the therapy room. There's no doubt about it. Impossible. And over the years, I've trained many, many people to be psychotherapists, as you know. And I can say universally that one of the themes of the beginning therapists go on placements. Uh, they then go into supervision. And one of the th central themes is is the very early therapist or trainee therapist believes they have to be perfect. Yeah. They have to get it right. Yeah. They can never get it wrong. And the problem with that process is, too, it's a very hard narrative upon yourself, yeah. but it also buys into a system for the client. In other words, the other person can't be vulnerable. They can't, they can't make mistakes. They can't have failures. All the things they probably tell themselves off for. Yeah. And it's not right for us to be put on a pedestal, really. <laughs> no. 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 Well, you know, uh, that, that that's correct. And unfortunately, it's the most common thing that happens. Yeah. I say, I say unfortunately because there's a fortunate part about it. We can use the idolising transfers to actually support the relationship and build on the process but the other side of it of course is that most people come into therapy have a what i call father christmas uh, yeah. process which is the therapists that are there to fix them yeah and they cannot not be perfect yeah which is a heavy burden to carry <laughs> as a it's impossible it's an impossible impossible burden to carry you might want to use it and think about it in terms of idealizing transference to, to make for a supportive relationship and it's an impossible one yeah. and of course it's the internal internal critic in their own uh heads which is telling themselves off even twice as hard as as their external reference yeah because in their in their heads they probably carry a very vicious internal critic uh which is telling them they can't be a failure you know they have to be perfect they can't get things wrong and that they're stupid and they're this or that. Yeah. They don't, if they're not getting nine out of 10 or 10 out of 10 uh, in anything in their lives. It's the, it's the critic they carry, which reminds them of the father or the mother when the, uh, the younger self comes home and gets nine out of 10 for the maths or nine, 10 for the history. And the father says, well, where did you get, where's the other one gone? You know, yeah. It's that, the one that you didn't get. Yeah. yeah, it's that internal critic they carry with them. Yeah, yeah, and there's again, I, I think it's my stuff. Um, but there's something for me that I always feel uncomfortable about being thought of or referred to as an expert. Oh yes, and and nine out of ten people who come to see therapists, this is why I call it a Father Christmas. Yeah. Post expect the therapist to fix them yeah and therefore they project that the therapist is the expert yeah that's the hidden father christmas process that you know for most clients to come in through the room they and i think it's a really good topic and a really good you know conversation and exploration about the hidden things that are in the therapy room that often that would be a great podcast but this is what yeah Great, yeah. Right, great podcast, and um, the Father Christmas process is extraordinarily uh, powerful. Yeah, and when you say you know it may be something to be a bad expert, well, it may or may not be, but I know that projection's going to come your way. Yeah, therapist, and of course, what also will come its way eventually is the dis <coughs> is the disappointment. 
<laughs> when you fall on you. or when they realize that you're not all that they thought you were. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, 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 absolutely. You must know what I mean here. Yeah, and you know, I, I'm not sure whether I mentioned this in past, past podcasts or not, but that happened with my supervisor. They fell off the pedestal. And I can remember it hit me like a ton of bricks when I realised that they weren't perfect. <laughs> oh, oh. They can't be perfect. Yeah. Because there's no such thing. Oh. In fact, they set themselves up to fail. Uh, anybody who goes through that whole process of attempting to be perfect is always setting themselves up to fail. Yeah. Because there isn't such a thing. Certainly not a perfect therapist anyway. So what's number two on the list? <clears throat> oh, yes. They're mostly going to be should do this and should do that. That's what I'm saying. It doesn't, you know. Anyway, number two, not being attuned to the client's feelings and mislabeling them. Oh. Uh, suggesting, for example, that the client is angry when they are sad is an empathic failure. It's crucial to listen very carefully prior to labeling a feeling. The therapist's role is to join the client and utilize the client's input to then label the feeling. A rush to labeling is a problem. Time, patience, and being in the moment should be part of a good therapist's repertoire. Well, that told us. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, what they're talking about really is how important it is for a client to attune. Yeah. Number one, to attune to the client's process. Yeah. Uh, secondly, which I, I agree with both these things I want to say, not making assumptions. Yeah. Thirdly, not defining a person in terms of feelings or labeling or whatever it is. Yeah. I'll say again, that may happen. The bit that's really important is what the therapist does after they've made this so-called mistake. Yeah. <clears throat> and of course, if they can account for the rupture and then say, and and in your history, are the people who haven't listened to you or you felt defined by or misled by? How you know, how about tell me a little bit about that? Yeah. That's the bit the therapist needs to get out. Yeah. Yeah, and it, it you know the, that second one as well as the first one, it, it does sound very, you know, I don't know, just like you say, it's parental. It's it's very scripted, and this is what you should do, and this is what you shouldn't do. Yeah, I'm in lead. Yeah, yeah, definitely, and uh, you know sometimes <clears throat> we, I don't want to say you know I I don't like making presumptions about clients and what the you know, displaying is that the right thing that they're actually feeling inside? Because we've all got racket behaviors and we cover up cover up things. We might be feeling one thing, but we present in a different way. So again, there's lots of things that go on, you know, internally that we're not aware of. So it's about inquiring about things. You look yes. this way. Is that what's actually going on? Type of thing. Correct. Absolutely correct. Yeah. Uh, I think that. I'm going to take the word should out here, but the, I think, um, and it takes a long time, what I'm talking about here, to train the therapist to move away from assumptions yeah. is a very valid point, but it can, you know, it's not going to be done overnight. No. Because humans think in assumptions all the time. Yeah. I don't I, I don't know whether it was in your training or you know somebody else's training but it was mentioned to me about think alien literally mm. you know we we do have preconceived ideas about certain things and certain behaviors whereas if we think alien then we can inquire what's actually going on yeah think martian that's yeah. Right. yeah yeah absolutely and it's what eric byrne advised uh in uh i don't know which book it is i probably I would think it's the script book, which yeah. is what you say, hello, 1969. Um, I think Martian. Yeah. And I use that a lot. I do because I'll get that instant thought or assumption in my mind. And then it's like, well, maybe that's not what's going on. Mm. Yeah. yeah. It's far, far best to do what you've just said. <coughs> <coughs> Excuse me. 
kidding. Coffee. I'm fucking sorry. I had a fig roll with my cup of tea. Oh, well, that's not good. Have you got a bit? <laughs> so I leave all talking to you. No, seriously, I think inquiry is the way forward. Yeah, definitely. Number three or four. Number three or four. Go through. Of interest. Oh, checking out. Yeah, so I've heard this one frequently and I'm very saddened by it. I've heard several clients describe therapists who have appeared to checked out and even fallen asleep during the session. Oh my God, <laughs> I've never done that. <laughs> oh God, I'm sure I can kind of put an odd podcast, but the thing must roll must have gone down the wrong way. Have you Have you ever fallen asleep, checked out? being bored or anything like that um i haven't fallen asleep and i wouldn't say that i've checked out but possibly been bored <clears throat> sometimes oh. yeah being completely honest and authentic about things yeah yeah and i i, I think it is important to be attuned to clients and tend to pay attention to clients again you need to follow that up by using it in terms of a person's history but you know i would also like to talk about transfers in all this lot <clears throat> and that is um if the client is it flex expects the other or they've had it in their history where their father mother reported other people have checked out yeah not paid attention to them or neglected them they will project those expected responses onto the therapist. Yeah. I think for me, the times where I have sort of got bored is when I feel like they're deflecting. They're, they're giving me too much information about a story rather than actually getting to the point of things. There's lots of stuff to fluff it up. And yeah, I don't, I don't know whether it's killing time somehow. See, I think most of what happens in a co-created, in a co-created relationship with therapist client, is transferential. Yeah. I, but think... I, I, I will actually say to them, <clears throat> you know, maybe not necessarily I'm bored with the story, but I will say there's an awful lot of information that you're giving me that I'm not sure is relevant to what we were talking about, yeah. and kind of pull them back into it somehow. And if they've had, yeah, I agree with you. Yeah, yeah. So I, 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 I'm not definitely not full. <laughs> yeah. Next one on this list. Um, I don't know where it's gone actually, but you know they're all what they should, what your therapist should and shouldn't be done. You know, project their own issues onto their clients' lives. <laughs> well. That's easier said than done. Yeah, that's transference and countertransference, isn't it? That's that's part of the relationship. But it's being aware of it again. And, you know, if there is a rupture, using that as part of the process. Yeah, which, and also, you know, a lot, what we're talking about here in terms of transference is unconscious phenomena. Yeah. So the therapist often isn't uh, aware of it or if they do become aware of it, they need to take the supervision then to therapist, you know, their own therapy. Yeah. Therapist. Yeah. Uh, because, of course, it's not useful. So this is where <clears throat> the BACP and other regulating bodies, but I'm picking on the BACP because I want to, <laughs> <laughs> who actually don't have a requirement for their counsellors to go to therapy. Yeah. And, that, you know, this is what we're talking about here is a really, uh, uh, you know, important for people to go and look at their own transference. And, yeah. Because otherwise, they could do this all the time. Yeah. I think it's also worth mentioning as well that, you know, we, we have a life outside of the therapy room and things happen to us. You know, the life events and things like that, that... <laughs> We wouldn't be human if we didn't take some of that into the therapy room with us. Yeah, it's. I still, yes, I agree completely with you. And I think it's the duty, a duty of therapists and counsellors to have their own therapy. Yeah, so that we, we can 
work through our own things rather than constantly taking it in the therapy room with us. Yeah, because it's a really if we don't do that, it's a really hard ask actually. Yeah. Because we're not aware of it. Yeah. In the UK, CP is 160 hours. They have to do 40 hours a year. I've been I've been in therapy. I was in therapy almost the duration of my 36 year old career. So I saw it as a sort of um, real sort of uh, I'm saying a real duty along. It's part of the job. Now I'm not suggesting, you know, to anybody listening, they have to be in therapy or access to therapy for all of their career. But I am suggesting that they need to have a good stint of therapy. Uh, I think the UK CP would say 40 um, therapy hours uh, a year is quite good. Mm. That's 160 hours through training. It gives you a it gives the therapist a chance to actually reflect on their own script yeah. and it and it would help stop or at least minimize the therapist projecting their own issues on a client yeah i also think it's quite helpful for the client to maybe be aware that we've also experienced therapy yeah, you know, it's, it's kind of like having a baby and you find out that the midwife has never had kids. It's like you don't know what this feels like. You haven't experienced it firsthand. No, that's it's very important. Um, and um, so that's that was an, an, another one. Another one um, out of this Psychology Today magazine. Uh, therapists should talk about themselves too much. In other words, what they're really talking about is bringing their own ego into the therapy room. And, you know, the problem with that is if a client, if a therapist does that too much, they take away the opportunity for the client uh, to, talk, to, to, to talk about their own story, number one. And secondly, they probably, the client again, has probably had a history of um, significant other people defining them or... Yeah. Having know. said that, <clears throat> did you, when you were seeing clients, did you do a check-in? In in group, always. So okay. Check in. Yeah. Individual. I know that some some therapists do just take five minutes to do a quick check-in. What the client's been up to and what you've been up to as a you know a, a start off to the therapy session, and others don't. Oh. Well, I have heard of therapists who, uh, this is individually, um, who have said, um, okay, what you've been doing over the week in terms of getting some continuity from session to session. I've not heard of, though, a therapist talking about what they've been doing for the week. Okay. That doesn't mean it doesn't happen. Yeah. I suspect in the so-called relational therapy term that we've had where relationship is key to that I can see that I can, um, my fantasy is I can imagine that happening. Yeah. It's not one I, I'll go into pair, well, but not so. It's not one I approve of. I've, I've not done it personally, but I've had it done with me. Where therapists talk about what they've been doing through the week? Yeah. Why? Yeah. Oh, sorry, what's the thing? What's the clinical thinking behind that? I've no idea, but I did. I can remember thinking at the time, I'm paying for this time and you're using <laughs> it up telling me about what you've done. Yes. Yeah. yeah. That, that was how I felt as the client. Absolutely. And I, I haven't heard that clinical. I'd like to know the clinical thought behind that. Uh, if a therapist is going to talk, oh, well, I've been to Manchester City and I really enjoyed that. And I went cooking with my friend. And on Thursday, we did this. And then Friday, I played with my sister. I mean, yeah. Why would you? What's the clinical oh, thought? I, I didn't understand it. But I, I do. I do get to check in with the client about how their week's been. I think that's different. Yeah, yeah. Because there, you, you know, clinical folk could be saying you're providing a recorrective experience. You're providing uh, an accounting for continuity. You are, there's lots of clinical reasons to support checking in with a client's experience. I, I just can't think of anything the other way around. That no, me neither. Exist. Yeah. Doesn't mean it isn't. Um, but getting back, yeah, it's one of the constant, we'll call it mistakes for therapists, I think, is to bring their ego into the room to the extent where it shadows 
the client. I don't think that's useful. No. Because it's usually a repeat of history. Yeah. I'm not somebody who believes going the other way either, completely the other way where you don't speak. So I think congruence is the best step here. Yes. And I think what you mentioned earlier, and you mentioned it pretty much in every podcast as well, is what is the, the therapeutic point of doing it? What yeah. do you know what I mean? What what are you hoping for by doing that? Yeah. And how does yeah, it fit into a treatment plan sort of thing? Yeah, because I think I think I probably do say it in most podcasts. Yeah. But it's a very valuable thing, and it's something that we do need to keep in our mind. You know, how is this going to serve the client? That's right. And uh, uh, I do it a lot in supervision, of course, uh, which is promoting the therapist to think about the clinical reasons. Yeah. yeah. So I'm not going to go on and on, but I might mention another couple um, answering the phone. Oh, yeah, that's a good <laughs> Turn your phone off. Don't even have it in the room, for goodness sake. That's made me cough even more. <laughs> yeah. Have you ever done that? No, no. <laughs> I, di I didn't have my phone in the room with me. And, you know, if there was an emergency, they would have to wait for the hour until I got the call. Yeah. Unbelievable. Yeah. No, seriously, it's unbelievable, that, isn't it? Yeah. I can just about get in my head round if it's a real emergency. I don't know. Like, uh, client, yeah, therapist came and said, "Oh, I did. I, I did answer the phone because, you know, my doctor was phoning, and if I didn't take the uh, appointment, da da da." So <clears throat> I can just about get my head round that if the therapist at the beginning of the session had contracted for that. Yeah, yeah, and it only lasted a couple of minutes. Yeah. But even then, that feels uncomfortable for me. But I, I, yes, I agree. In certain situations, maybe it's a necessity. But yeah, because yes. that, that's that safe space, and and you know, yeah, it doesn't doesn't feel right for me that at all. No, it's a bit in the line. It's it's more. Uh, I was going to say it's a bit in the same ballpark for my sake. And taking extensive notes yeah yeah and losing eye contact and losing the connection while you're writing your notes down and things yeah <laughs> but i think it's worse just this whole process about answering your mobile phone yeah 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 that's, 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 that's laughable i'm surprised that's even in there that's a bit obvious <laughs> um asking the client how does that make you feel every other you know the, what they're on about is the fact that clients who therapists who repetitively are yeah. asking about how uh, a client feels um but I, yeah, I think it's really important to ask how the client feels i understand the repetitiveness might um take away from the actual process but i think i'll move away from all these because the thing about this is there are so many things that are transferential by nature yeah yeah. And, you know, like you said earlier on, the thing to focus on is is the rupture that it potentially can cause and, and how we use that as a gift in the therapy room. Because we will make mistakes. There is no, thing <laughs> about, you know, yeah. we need to resign ourselves to the fact that we're not perfect and we don't want to model perfection either. Yeah, I think it's a difference, difference between makes, mistakes or ruptures and unethical behavior yes yeah that's now okay there's a gray area there i understand that <clears throat> um but you know uh mistakes can become learning opportunities and gifts yeah if you're talking about uh you know ethical discrepancies i think it's a different world yeah yeah because, you know, as, as a parent, that's one of the things that I used to instill in my children, that it's a learning opportunity making a mistake. You know, when we, we get something wrong, it's it's an opportunity to learn how we can do better. Mm. Yeah. So it's, it's an interesting topic, but I do think that the sort of ethical issues, I mean, really important ones here, 
um, are in a different ballpark. And of course, you know, the whole definition of training psychotherapists uh, is around learning opportunities and how can a person learn to be a psychotherapist if they don't sort of uh, learn by experience? And with that may come so some so-called mistakes. Yeah. The yeah. most important is how you handle it afterwards. Definitely. I agree. And the other, you know, take away all learning from this podcast episode, if anybody's interested in, you know, what I take away from this podcast is not to Google things. <laughs> yeah. Because that list that you came up with of the 10 things, do you know what I mean? I, I suppose it's a good starting point, but I often say, I I say it quite a lot with my clients as well, is step away from Google. Google is not good. It's, you know. <coughs> it's terrible. Yeah, it can be useful in some situations, but in most, it's not very helpful at all. Most of the people I've ever trained to be therapists have such a high internal critic um, in themselves. Yeah. That they're always telling themselves off. Yeah. Um, you know, I'm always dealing with that internal critic. So I'm, I'm always teaching about compassion. Yeah. Um, Self-love. Yeah, and... You know, see these things as learning opportunities. Yeah. How we handle them. Yeah. Which yeah. is the most important thing to talk about in supervision. Definitely. So I've really enjoyed this podcast, Bob. Yeah. And, and I, you know, I know we've we've had a laugh during it, but you know, that's another learning opportunity. Uh, Not all is, therapy stuff is <laughs> it's interesting. <laughs> Certainly, I must apologize for everybody listening of my sudden attack uh my of cough and I think it's the fig roll that I had just before. Now, if we talk about making perfect podcasts, <laughs> don't do not eat a fig roll before you go onto a podcast. Definitely. <laughs> that's a that's a learning takeaway from this as well. Yeah. No Google and no fig rolls. <laughs> Until okay. next time, Bob, what we're going to be looking at is how to work with the younger self in therapy, which I know we've touched on. You touch on this in a lot of, but we're going to be focusing on that. Yeah, but a lot of therapy, of course, is how you work with the younger self. Yeah. Yeah. Okie doke until next time, Bob. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Take care. You've been listening to The Therapy Show, Behind Closed Doors podcast. We hope you enjoyed the show. Don't forget to subscribe and leave us a review. We'll be back next week with another episode.